Assassin's Creed Valhalla made over $1 billion. Open world games are some of the most popular titles, regardless of critic scores, and many times regardless of a fantastic number of problems. Why is that? What goes into making a game like Valhalla where the Vikings represented well? Did they really wear leather armor? How does the Anvil engine handle AI? Why do devs put Easter eggs in their games? All of those questions consistently pop up whenever the next big open world game comes. So sit back and let's talk about Assassin's Creed Valhalla. And by the time we're done with this series of videos, I think at the very least, you'll have an answer to a couple of those questions. Subscribe and you can be one of the people that votes on the next game we deep dive into. Good games really have to have very good cornerstones for their characters. This opening takes you through three elements that were vital to Viking lore. None of this is on accident. First, the celestial bodies, the cosmology, the idea of the stars being parts of the gods and their consistent vigil watching over you and judging the great heroes, but also imparting a deep feeling of freedom that the Vikings actually felt consistently. Then you have the mists, the evil of the mists for Vikings. The mist was a bad omen unless directly used in combat. It's where the monsters hid, where sounds echoed oddly and the otherworldly could wait for a warrior and swallow them up whole, the fireworm. Lastly, the forest. While Vikings are known for their excellent seamanship, it doesn't explain the whole story. To the Vikings, land travel was actually consistently about danger. The forests were also where monsters dwell, and even in Viking sagas, that's the feeling of foreboding that you get. Also, the speed of travel was so poor for them. Despite trees being used as a resource for ships, they also stopped you from traveling quickly. A warrior and his men could travel four to five times faster on a boat than they could by land. After this brief flash of light, like a rebirth, the game leaps in as you being Eivor as a child. I chose the male character, but currently the female Eivor is actually considered canon. We'll get back to the real interesting ideas that went into the casting and how that all came about in a moment. There's a lot of surprises there, but I do love looking through the space. The Vikings actually had a number of artistic periods, though we can't define their exact start and stop. There are a number of artifacts that show a change of the elements in swords and beds and ship design. For instance, going from long, thin, snake-like serpents to fatter and thicker fantastical types. When you first enter the Great Mead Hall, this is just such an overwhelming place for a child. The way that they have Eivor looking up at all these adults, the scale of everything, it's bigger than life. It plays off the idea of what a child wants to be. For every Viking child, and yes, Viking children did fight, they looked up to these massive men and women. They were their own gods in a way, which is also reflected in how much of their religion was based around ancestral worship, which I'll talk about in a couple moments. In the background also, you're going to see that clan design of the twin ravens of Odin. They traveled the world telling Odin about the deeds of men. Hugin and Munin were their names. Thought and memory are their translated titles into English. Ubisoft really has to pick and choose what they want to do when they want to create their own version of the Vikings. For instance, just look at Celebrations and Mead. Mead was a favored drink, supposedly, of the Scandinavians, the Vikings, and it's hard not to discuss those Vikings without adding in some story about Mead or a gameplay element like the developers actually did here. However, honey was traded for, and that trade saw at least two massive downswings as unrelated cultures themselves broke their backs on history's timeline, and the Vikings had to import honey from the south because Scandinavia, actually, most of it is just on the edge of honey bees' natural range. The flowering season's insanely short there, and it's too short for bees to collect pollen and nectar, and they actually starve to death. One of the sagas actually points this out with a trader traveling to Denmark to buy honey. However, if you look at the time period, much of Viking history passes right through the medieval warm period, which was a time where the earth was warmer, and in particular that area. And that might actually extend the natural rains of bees and flowering time because there are places that have been dug up where there were a large amount of dead bees. And this is actually sort of a mystery. And a lot of people just believe most likely they starved to death. This is one of the first moments you see a young child actually get a, a very large deed that they're going to be able to perform. Again, children were doing this kind of stuff at a very young age, fighting as well as meeting at these giant celebrations. And it is the same voice actor for father and son. Every single person, every single thing you do, every single deed you did was really watched over by the gods at any time. And that's one of the ways that they were actually able to hold together, especially in some of the different and the later trials and tribulations they had during their invasions. They were able to hold together because there wasn't just the feeling of brotherhood, but also a feeling of the gods directly watching. The Vikings believed they were involved in pretty much every single decision, including ignoring you and just being like, oh, Odin wasn't there that day. And in this scene, when they chose to show Eivor actually getting the ring band and the band to give to the king, that's actually a very important moment for a child. 
That's an armband, a wristband. It's a gift that's given to a, a visiting Jarl, somebody who's actually in control. Here, it's the king. But what's interesting there is they also had what were called hack bracelets. And these hack bracelets were actually silver, and you would wear them, you would have them with you, and you would break off a piece or chop off a piece and pay somebody with it. They're actually very accurate scales that the traders used in both areas that the Vikings actually attacked. Well, I should say not both areas they attacked, but the area they were from, as well as the multiple areas that they traveled to. And when they traded, they would use this and they would have it with them, break off a piece and they would weigh it and say, that's what it was. So they basically carried the earliest version of a credit card with them at any time. It's just a really unique way of doing things. Here we get to see them putting down what I would consider to be the invention of line dancing. I actually don't know if this is the way that anybody knows if this is the way that they danced, but I found it hilarious that you could actually do this. Again, celebration was something that even incredibly young children were involved with. Young children to the point where they were by far way younger than 10 years old. They were already usually trained very well in their weapons as well as in celebration as well as drinking. It was something that wasn't necessarily held back from the young people that lived in the land. I dig this. Another thing that I actually was impressed with, it's replicated here somewhat, but one of the things that's come about, especially in the last couple of years, is that there really wasn't a lot of leather clothing that we see. Dungeon and Dragons has really blown that up into something, and certainly cosplayers. But for Vikings in particular, it was pretty much what you see Eivor wearing, which was furs and linens. A wool was a huge one versus actually leather. When I was first playing this, I actually thought Sigurd was going to be some kind of bully, but Ubisoft did a really good job representing the importance of this particular moment for Eivor as well as for Sigurd. And it lodges that into your memory banks as an older boy who's well beyond Eivor's physical ability sort of passes on trying to take the ring and instead leaves it for him. And that sense of trust is what really moves Valhalla forward during some of the narrative beats. And it's also an excellent device for storytelling when things go wrong between the two. I don't know. They just did such a good job with the atmosphere here in this first scene to me. This is a really good part here where you just see all of the refuse and debris of their partying occurring at any one time. You can see all those clothing, the different types of clothing that everybody has. They did a good job. When the artists were talking originally about creating Eivor and creating this world, one of the things I found hilarious that they admitted was that Eivor was not the name they were going to go with. They actually had a completely different name they were going to go with and found out from one of their historians it meant something like horse. It was completely wrong. It's sort of like a Britney Spears tattoo. We're like, uh, probably should actually not just look at the direct translation, probably should see why exactly that word is used. And they switched that word right prior to recording. They actually had uh, tons, tons and tons of lines to record, and they had to go through and change his name to something else. Little fun fact here also, he uses the fake name later on in a mission, and that was the original name they were going to go with. Especially when you're making a game, you do have to take some artistic license, and they do here and they do throughout Valhalla with the amount of plentiful burden that everybody has, the food everywhere. Something that you would actually see at some celebrations for sure, but you see this pretty much everywhere in the game, and it's used as clutter, which is fine. But one thing to remember is that especially in this time frame, the Vikings as a people who were technically, you know, obviously from Scandinavia and various different places where they came together, depending on what year this was. But when you look at how they actually lived, they had two great depressions prior to the timing of this game in particular, two times where other cultures that they traded with had actually started to crumble around them. And by doing so, that took a lot of money away from the Vikings. It actually had two of these great depressions where the trade started to drop off, then came back. And it's just that sometimes the lavish amounts of debris is weird. Because they're an oral tradition society, they do have runes, but they don't necessarily write on parchment. They never had a literate society like that. And so what happens is these oral traditions take on the heroes of the past, heroes that may have traveled, that may have traded, that were doing well, great kings, and those become gods. Those become incredibly powerful ancestors. And then you have that slowdown where trade goes bad, and then as trade picks up again, you have more myths where you can talk about the good old days. These start to build up. And what you end up having is a society that is orally incredibly strong when it comes to their belief in their ancestors having a direct impact because many times those ancestors were placed in the ways gods themselves, the gods themselves were most likely based on actual just people who had done very well. And it's a very interesting society if you, if you track that kind of thing. So as Eivor comes up here and gives this bracelet to the king, 
when I was looking at this kind of stuff and sort of deciding why I liked this so much. I think the reason why I do like this is they did a very good job keeping the animus out of this until about a fourth of the way through. I'm not against the animus at all. I just think having it at the starting would have sort of bumped players out of the game. This entire environment and the way that Ubisoft has handled the lighting is fairly well done. I really actually think this part looks good. When Valhalla first came out, there were a lot of complaints about its lighting, and I had them myself where it just never felt exactly right. Developers have discussed how overcast days and weather are hard to make materials look good. And of course, where Valhalla is set, the developers ran right into that from the get go. I love in the background those deep woodworks that they have. The Vikings were, in particular, very good at designing stuff on weapons, designing stuff into the ends of boats, and you may not know this, but beds. They actually had a huge, just a huge fascination with making sure that beds were very ornate with a lot of designs and color work around them. This song is just so good. There are a couple notations in Explorer's Logs about Vikings and their singing ability. That's not to be confused with flighting or their oral traditional storytelling. But one thing seems to be agreed upon, and that's that they were universally terrible and out of tune. And the game's moment right here just perfectly reflects a bunch of tone-deaf giants singing body songs. Sound the mighty So here, his father actually says, Eivor, take a step back. Don't come with us. Now, I want to show you guys something here as I walk around. One of the first things you notice in this location is there are kids crying, but Eivor is the only one not crying. He's not scared. He's not crying at all. Obviously, this is showing a little bit of that strength that he has, but you see a lot of kids behind him and in front. You'll see kids sort of wailing, not knowing what to do. And the idea of having Eivor being the one who knows what to do is awesome. And you can just walk right out if you want and start to see this battle. And this battle will be a cutscene, so I'm just going to let it go through as it runs. I love the mother, man. She, she was a fighter. One of the things, not only were they amazing fighters, but they had pretty much the exact same laws as the men in Viking tradition, which included divorce. They could divorce a man. There were various ways in which they could not only take charge and take votes within the actual community themselves, but they would actually have a home key. And what that was was a key that they would have. And when the fathers went to raid, they would pass the key to the wife. And it was a very big deal. It meant that the wife had 100% say in anything that had to do with that actual fighter's homestead. I love this pseudo first person kind of camera that you see. That's something you don't see in a lot of games. If you guys noticed, it went right up to the side, almost like a camera just connected directly to him. And you were looking through his eyes as you saw his mom actually in danger, which is why you try to pick up this giant damn sword that you can barely carry. Oh, first kill, by the way, too. And if you guys noticed, they actually made sure to show that the actual guard there was locked against the rail to show damage and then he comes in swing and you can see that step up where this guy's this young kid has obviously been in a number of fights with the odin statue there perfect little position these guys are dressed very well the idea is the bad guy who's here has done well for himself far better than this actual group has but he he wants what they have and that's something that we saw with vikings a lot of times uh, especially in their own lands vikings had fights with people that were very short distances away because of the forest itself being so thick and being a place where, for the most part, they did not travel nearly as much as they did on the waterways. The meeting of the two leaders here has done very well. You get to see the looks of your father, seeing the damage being done actively to the village, pushing him to a decision that he most likely would not have done. And that quicker circling camera slowing down right at the end lets you sort of take in the stunning amount of damage in a quick moment. Let's listen to some of the audio. No. No, very. No, Aaron! Pick up your axe! No. Kill the man! Some of the best audio direction in the game is actually in this cutscene. The child just getting out that little whisper of disbelief and fear and dread seeing his father die versus that courageous yell that you would expect in a lot of other games or movies. And down onto a frozen lake. This is also one of the first places where you see the combination of Eivor and fate. I love this look. 
staring up to the Aurora Borealis, which they, of course, believed was created by the gods, looking up at the stars. It's just this awesome trilogy here. And then suddenly the horse dives down. And when Eivor, who gets the term wolf kissed, by this attack that goes on is is basically looks like he's going to die. You see the ravens there as well, which just once again connects to Odin. It's a story that we see connected throughout all of this game. I love this sort of crawling towards this, smart enough to know, and then gets attacked anyway. And this this reminds me a little bit of Revenant, even though that, that bear absolutely destroyed him. We're talking about how difficult it was right there with the wolf to sort of go back and rear up. It looks a little, I don't know what you would call it, a little janky. Maybe just a little stiff for what they're actually trying to show there. And then you start getting the visions. This is something that, of course, with Vikings, visions were a big thing. I'll explain why people assume that uh, there were particular drugs that they were getting those visions from. But here we go. Psh, Raven's coming down. Save Eivor. And then you see the glitch in the Matrix. I think this is just a great spot. It was very cool to see this because you get that idea that we've seen in other games for the Assassin's Creed saga where, oh, this particular DNA is sort of messed up. The memories aren't there. And it's at that point that you are sort of solidifying your step into the Animus as well as the future that you're going to be exploring at this time. Now, the male and female Eivors that you have, you actually got to choose male or female, but you also got to choose one that basically indicated that the stories, the oral traditions, the DNA itself is stronger with a particular sex during this particular story. So you could pick a generic Eivor that would switch between male and female. The director actually stated very clearly that they had thought from the beginning after Jacob and Evie worked so well in Syndicate. And of course, we saw this again replicated in Odyssey. The idea was to go ahead and have the person be able to choose both. And I think it fits very well with this story. They didn't have a female Eivor picked yet, and it was actually the male voice actor who was a friend of hers who knew who she was, liked her voice, and basically slid a piece of paper with the numbers on it to the people who were interviewing him when they were talking about having a female Eivor, and they called her up, and she did the voices over a really bad phone connection while she was out on her deck. They were like, you know, we want you to do this, and she was screaming and yelling, and she was like, the neighbors probably think I'm absolutely nuts. But she was doing all of this voice work uh, over the uh, over the phone to identify with this character, to sort of try to see if she could bring it to life. And I thought she did a very good job. And it was a really cool thing to see these voice actors working together like that, where he was just like, here's here's a name for you. He also didn't know exactly what game this was going to be. This is very normal for voice actors where they don't know what the game is going to be. He ended up not knowing. And then as he was, you know, starting to talk to them about doing more and more work, he finally found out it was an Assassin's Creed game. So I'm sure for him made him quite happy. Also, if you do watch, uh, what is that? Last Kingdom, he's Knut in that. And he ended up um, not playing the original character at first. He was doing an interview for Sigurd and they actually liked him more for Eivor, which I thought was very cool. They also guesstimated about 11,000 lines per person uh, with multiple different emotions for each take. I'm telling you, at that time, you really have to trust your audio and vocal director. You will be worth your weight in silver. <laughs> to the ship. They didn't know if Ubisoft directors and, and the people working at Ubisoft would want a Viking game. The little hints and rumors we saw, even a picture of Valhalla in a, another game that they did, weren't 100%. This is something that Ubisoft does have actually a habit of doing is putting like tidbits in their games. They did not know. So they had an eight hour presentation to prep for showing the directors what they wanted to do and that they wanted to make a Viking game. And the directors within 30 minutes were like, this is awesome. We absolutely want you to do this. And then they were laughing. They were like, we have seven and a half hours left of the day. What are we supposed to do? Here we go. Saving the day. Pshh. That must have hurt. I, I do enjoy the sort of way in which this character fights. Eivor has that blunt, brunt way of fighting. This is something that they tried to capture in mocap, and he talked about the difficulties of mocap a great deal, and I'll, I'll sort of explain that in a bit. But I love the idea of the off-camber fighting that you see this character do versus a lot of the others. I would say Syndicate, we saw this replicated a, at least a little bit with those two characters there, with their cane fighting and that kind of stuff. Ubisoft, just like a lot of other devs, have difficulties with identifying how they're going to start out the game, what the character is going to be like, where his power level is. And I really enjoy this, where the 14 years has just been him looking for this guy. Open world and HUD and map mess is a very real thing. Ubisoft does allow for you to turn off a large number of text alerts and interacting 
with the game world, and it'll leave you a very clean screen when you're done. You'll always see the jokes where somebody's like, if Ubisoft made this game and they show all the screen prompts, you've been able to turn those off for years. I do think that's vital, though, as a player, as most games will lead you from point to point to point to point, resulting in the player traveling from point one to two, while No HUD lets the player instead explore the location they're traveling from that little boat dock to the mountains to further up. It's a real place moving to a real place from a real place, and there's additional data there. And that data can then be used in discussions about the game, whether you like it or not, and why, really. It's also one of the reasons why I think a lot of people who review or play a great deal of time in an open world can end up finding themselves having a difficult time actually explaining everything they did. Because a lot of times, those monuments, those places, aren't actually solidified in memory because they aren't a place anymore. Well, Eivor has the bow and arrow you'll see and the swords and the axes, the major reason we do see historically Vikings with axes, though the double-bladed one really doesn't have a real connection to them, was due to the ease of making that particular weapon versus a sword. Also, it was a piece of equipment and a tool to be used, which was highly valued by the Vikings. Building these locations and making sure that they actually fit the theme is not easy. They do have to make sure that the place like this is still going to reflect a feeling of rural outdoorsiness, but also have elements that the player can use to get ready for the battle ahead. And I love that this is in a tight outlet, a little cove of darkness. And when you start to climb out of it, you are technically climbing into one of those oh shit moments when you look out over a massive vista. It's a very good entry. For a moment, we'll jump into graphics and the engine work here. So this engine, of course, is the redone engine that they've used for the past titles. They're always trying to adjust it. I do find it sort of unique that one of the biggest pushes that they had had for so long was Unity and trying to get multiple people on the screen. And then you play a game like this. And in many ways, Odyssey and Origins, where you're trying to get a longer draw distance and you're trying to compare those two and contrast those two, the work that you just did and the adjustments you just did may not make as much sense in the new title that you're using. And that's just something that happens with proprietary engines. Speaking of the engine itself, Valhalla leverages a number of the systems and almost all the testing formats from Origins and Odyssey. When designing locations like this, it's laid down procedurally as wilderness using a map that's sculpted in the world designer. And that has particular values that roughly correspond to real world locations and flora. And then the designers go in and they place the items like the camps and the cabins and the forts and the docks and the castles and they adjust all that by hand. So the worry that procedural work would somehow replace everything really hasn't come to the forefront yet. We'll talk about world design for a little bit. For many years, Ubisoft has been sending people to whatever city or location that they're trying to mimic in their games. And in one way, that's paid off for them. It's also paid off for the gamer because those trips that they actually took are why you're doing discovery tours right now. The discovery tours are really replicating in many ways the tours that the actual people took. And these travels allow for the artists in particular, as well as the designers and the leads to understand exactly what they want to create, especially with those who are creating assets or those wanting to help the teams understand the overall vision, the impressions, the impact of going to these locations and seeing the geography, seeing the rock, the land, the animals, the trees, lets them actually look out through the eyes of a character, at least a little bit. One part that the entire team took away from the trip that is backed up by historical text is that the Vikings would end up choosing small outlets or inlets and tiny coves that let them ambush others, but also let them hide. More importantly, due to the landscape, though, they were right up against massive walls of rock or otherwise impenetrable terrain right behind them. This really feeds into the idea of the people and the land really believing that nature and spirits were a thing, like a person waking up when they're near a mountain range. It's hard not to stop for a moment and take that into account. We've heard it from astronauts who've landed on the moon or seen the Earth. The Vikings called that their backyard. It was a dangerous place, a monolithic place, but a place that could easily be mistaken for where the gods dwelled and where evil creatures lived because sometimes somebody probably just went up there, tripped, fell, and broke their neck, and everybody thought it was Grendel. This kind of stuff actually pays off in how you decide or define the way you're going to do your skill sets and your abilities. Of course, Celestial makes complete sense for the skills to see them up and above you, sort of like what we see in Skyrim and the abilities, but not only what they will be in the game, but what they might look like. They also started to realize, especially because they went to a couple museums, they started to realize how dark a lot of locations would be in the game. The insides of buildings, for example, many times are a lot of the same color because they only used firelight in a lot of these locations to light them. It's not that they didn't have other means, but they a lot of times just had 
one hearth and that was where that that light was coming from so the teams actually made small adjustments in the actual way they displayed their buildings they put small gaps in the sides even though that would allow wind in obviously but it helped them add an identity to the interior areas and this is something that's come up with valhalla for a lot of gamers a lot of gamers have complained about the lighting valid complaint but an expected one whether you're talking to people who do race car games, fighting games, one of the things that you will hear a lot of them talk about is dying light and how difficult that can be or whatever their term would be. But you're talking your sunsets and sunrises. When you want to do a sunset or sunrise, the sky, that's not the issue. It's actually making things within the game world look vibrant or interesting to a game player and not having too much of that desaturated lack of glow that you actually see. And especially in a game like Valhalla, which is overall, a, you know, an action adventure RPG, third person kind of game. They do want it to pop a bit. What I thought was very cool, and this is something they not only did in in this game, but they also did in Odyssey that I know of, which is a lot of grayscale paintings. And if you think about gray boxing in video game terms, what is gray boxing? That's when designers will put a big gray box to indicate the mountain and a smaller box to indicate a village location and sort of a gray area over here to indicate the lake. And they'll say, you know, go and play these. Do they feel right? Do our interactions working well? Does this break off the visual flow of the location? That's gray boxing. And you can see a lot of this data in the art of Valhalla book that you can buy. They did a lot of gray values in their paintings, just paintings that were just different shades of gray, setting things up and look at that flow in their concept art as well. It's sad it's so difficult sometimes to find the concept art for various games, because if you go back and look, DeviantArt has it, and so do some of the other websites for artists. There's some immaculate and just unbelievable concept art out there for games. And Assassin's Creed, bar none, is some of the best. And it can be quite difficult, especially in a game like this. The artist had brought up that you have somewhat dry mountainous areas like West Mercia, and then you have Celtic areas. You have the different bands in different locations, the different tribes and groups, different bandits. And you also go to, you know, I don't want to spoil it. It's been a while, but you also go to many lands beyond just these first two. Not many, but a couple big lands. And you want to make sure that you can identify the difference between them. How do you identify it? One of the things that the developers actually did, I love this look. I just got to stop. I love this. He looks up at the actual focal point that you're going to go to. And this is something that Ubisoft has done well in multiple games. But I just like it that the character feels like a part of the world. This is something that we see a lot of times where characters don't really feel like they're a part of the world. Regardless of my issues with Valhalla that I personally had, I still do love that kind of stuff where a character will look at an interesting thing. It just works. It makes it feel like it's connected. So what I was going to say about the art design, they ended up sectioning off all of the lands within the first two locations f starting. Then they did the other locations later. They sectioned them off into territories and decided color palettes for those territories. So what you would see is, for example, Mercia, and you would see a color palette there with multiple colors indicating these are the predominant colors that we want to use to shade everything, that we want this entire location to sort of feel like it's in summer, this one to feel like it's in autumn, and of course, where we are now to feel like it's in winter. Synchronization has always been a sore spot between gamers and Ubisoft, and they've done a lot of study on gamers and what the different people who play these games have thought, so much so that they have removed a great deal of the bonuses from synchronization itself and adapted it for the last couple games that they made. Not sure why they haven't done some kind of challenge climb for major synchros and then had minor synchronizations that don't do much more than what we currently see. Obviously, most Assassin's Creed games have one or two really insanely high spots as well, like feature points. It would be nice to see them branch out a bit and not just completely neuter them, but at the same time, possibly not returning that repetition that we've seen in prior games. A great example of this is Horizon Zero Dawn, where the tall necks aren't just arbitrary towers you climb, but animals moving about the game world as a piece of it with their own lore. If Ubisoft focused on offering historical information or some other lore or in-game information when achieving Synchro, it'd probably go a long way to keep players from feeling like it was just a simple climb and dive. Another trouble spot for Ubisoft and for Valhalla was its combat animations. They were noticeably truncated, something I've talked about in the review and elsewhere here, where the animation blending that occurs during moves looks really patchy. Like the game stops for just a second and is like, do you really want to do that? There's always a danger of breaking something that worked fine whenever you're designing anything in life, and even more so in a game. 
And they talked about this in the art book itself. There were all these interviews they did a long time ago. And once the game was out, you know, this stuff just, it released like it was day one. So it was obvious they knew. They said, listen, we're going to try to make a big world that's incredibly cool to traverse and move around. And we're okay with some things not being perfect. But just like with Odyssey, the games were in an alpha state almost a full year prior to release. This is so that the developers can really stress the polish and the movement, the quests, and how the world worked. Well, every two weeks, they actually did a video to show everyone on the teams all the headway that had been made. They also had a nightly test build, and this involved teleporting characters every 15 meters and then reloading and loading the game world and repeating that and tracking performance to verify that there were no issues during or after any changes that were made. It's just a little sad that during those changes, when everything was being made, they didn't take just a little bit closer look to the actual animations of Eivor and the attacks with his weapons. I was never 100% sure just how much of a bowman a Viking would be, a normal Viking. And when you read a lot of the information on Vikings, many of them were well-trained on bows because they hunted. But they actually, just in the same way that I'll explain in a little bit about how they treated horses, they did treat it a little differently. And they did use the bows in a, not necessarily a completely different way, but perhaps not in a way that we would expect, where we would expect a person to possibly kite a bad guy, where you just basically are firing your arrows and backing up, which is obviously the way some of us played Valhalla. They actually were known for just taking pot shots and then running in because one of the things that they believed in was not only up close battle, but certainly the, the shield wall, which was something that they were quite well known for and something that they believed was handed down directly from Odin to them as a proper strategy, which did actually work. And multiple people who've written journals later had talked about it being a very difficult thing to get through a Viking wall. And the way they did, the way they sort of put it together was just enough to stymie a lot of different people who were facing off against them. Some of the bows or parts of bows that have been found indicate that they had somewhere around a 90 to 120 pound pullback. And I can tell you as somebody who has hunted all my life with bows, that is a incredible amount of pullback on a bow. It's not saying that other nations didn't have the same. I'm just saying I was surprised when I found out what they were doing, what kind of bows that they were using and just how strong those bows were and how much damage they could do. Yeah, so here we see something that crops up in open world games, no matter how they do their AI. The meta AI that Ubisoft uses tracks all creatures close and far from the player using a system of states, invisible, virtual, and real entities. So an invisible AI would be one that's tracked by location and status, but can't be seen by the player, and it's not drawn out. Then you have your virtual, which lets them track it closer as well as feed it some very basic animations, and then real entities such as the wolf. So this is a great idea of how to handle AI. However, you do see situations like this where some creatures go between sensing the player than an enemy, but due to how it is updated, it can get a bit of that zigzag pattern because the AI has chosen flee. When it runs away, it runs from the player. Then the AI gets an order to flee when it sees another animal or creation or enemy and it zips back. If this was updated by the frame, it's more in a move order that you would see a character possibly run completely away from both of them. But in this case, really perfectly in the middle and it gives you that zigzag, not natural look. The issue that I have with that is that you don't see the enemies really hunting those creatures. I get that they probably don't want a bunch of foxes in these guys' locations because then players would ask, why is it that this fox is just having no issue playing and laying down with these guys? You could explain that off in fiction, you know, lie a little bit to tell a lot. It's a, it's a video I'm going to be doing in a while about how gamers are okay with lies told to them as long as they in some way make sense in a game world. It's a, a particular issue that you see in Norway where I noticed it more here than I did as you go to the later lands. And I'm not 100% sure why. It's almost like they have a glitch with just some of the locations in this particular spot. As we see the raven fly by, I want to talk about myths. They've always fascinated me. The ravens, their prevalence in Viking mythology makes a great deal of sense. First, ravens have a tendency to breed in the autumn and fall months. Would explain why in battles, what happened during that time frame would also see a large number of ravens compared to normal around battle locations. This then combined with the fact that the Vikings loved winter campaigns throughout all of their mentions and other cultures. They faced off against multiple foes, and they were known for their love of fall and winter campaigns. That's touted. This also colors the dealings that they had with kings they faced against. Sometimes they'd be a king that was nearby. They would make them pay Vikings dangle, basically money to the Danes, so they wouldn't fight. The Vikings would leave and then come right back during a winter campaign when most other armies had a number of difficulties doing that. 
So you can see why this myth that Odin's ravens seem to be prevalent during Viking encounters and larger battles, it actually makes sense. That basic construct of a myth is right there for you to see. I really like this spot. Ubisoft's had a great deal of success in world building. And one part is always the passage of time. The idea is that these places at some point passed from one being to another, one group to another, just aged over time, taken over by one group and then another, then left to its own devices with those brambles and already around them. And those shields are still proudly patched onto it from the previous owner. And then also mixing in the lit torch, which shows you that somebody is currently also inhabiting that area as well. Within the same notes and journals and travel entries from a variety of sources, they indicated that the Vikings had a very particular weakness and a particular strength. Of course, the ability to war in the wildest of environments and the wettest and the coldest. However, their weakness was heat, and some groups did use that against them. It also fits in the overall connection about their armor not being leather, as leather doesn't breathe at all, versus the chain and linen that's more established as an explanation now and is mimicked more here than I would say a lot of older games might. We're going to take this guy out. Boop. Whoa, wait, what? Uh, okay, I missed that guy. I'm glad his friend wasn't looking. I'm just going to sneak up here. and. Psh. Yeah, see, that's one of the things you notice. When I did the reverse strike back to his neck, uh, it catches them, which again is a part of the, the idea of this axe and the ability to not only slice into somebody, but catch them and pull them off guard, which you certainly see many times here. But it is a quicker animation. If you look, it's almost like the very end of the animation is sped up. Now, this is something that's actually done, by the way, in it's not done as much, but it was done a lot in old martial arts films when they would cut the actual film. And so the very last bit of the punch would be sped up. It would have this feeling of impact. And I think that they wanted to do that. I just am not 100% sure it actually worked. While sound has some problems in Valhalla, which I will get to at a later time, the handling of processing is not bad and have a couple fixes patched in as well. They do an excellent job of multi-layering the audio so that one foot on the rocks and one foot in the snow actually both play as they should. When looking around here and especially playing with NoHUD, I like these banners, these floating banners. It works really well for a player to identify and visually get some parsed out data from a location if they choose not to use the menu system. The idea that they're able to use these and know that there's a particular band here or a particular visually informative location. For example, if the banner comes up, it lets the player understand that this place might be a splitting of the trail or camps, friendly or foe. You might be wondering why I don't have my helmet on. I'll put it on in a little bit, but I do want to talk about that and get it out of the way. Of course, we know now Vikings did not use horn horned helmets. They would not have believed in them, first of all, because somebody could just get a hand on one and pull it right off to you. They were also technically inherently pretty goddamn dangerous to have a horned helmet when you're in the midst of battle with other people. So the idea of having that coming off of your head didn't make sense. Slipped away in the sword clash. And what of you? Kyotwe tried to sell me off. Historians have battled over how did they use their shields? These shields had lengths that were up to 40 inches across, meaning you've got a massive shield with you. A lot of different movies that you see, it's, it's always defensive. It's always holding it up and somebody hitting it. But here, especially in the last 10 to 15 years, there's been multiple studies that indicate that most likely they used them very aggressively as well. There was a lot of damage on a couple shields that have been found that didn't really make sense for somebody hitting the shield, but more for the hitting of the shield against somebody else. Throughout a lot of testing, the evidence became pretty clear that that damage on those shields just doesn't correspond to the more expected turtle defense and instant counter that a lot of historians originally thought. Those were present, but the evidence also seems to indicate that a number of the damage marks were just brought on by using that shield forcibly in an offensive way, punching enemies and using the Viking strength to push enemies with the shields back or down. Especially as large as these men and women were, it makes perfect sense, and the devs chose to embrace those ideas in the gameplay and the fighting system. It also offers a nice blunt kind and raw way for the player to attack enemies that fits the feeling of a Viking. Personally, I love the idea of dual wielding shields into an enemy's face is just the highest level of disrespect that you can deliver to another fighter. So they're consistently exploring different ages and different fighting styles and the idea that they come upon something and say, you know what, we need to change it so you can do two handed weapons and then change it to a weapon in each hand and then change it to where you can now use a shield in one hand or a shield in both hands in Valhalla. 
that is a lot of animation work and a lot of testing and understanding the way that these weapons would work, what kind of hit damage that they will do, how the animations blend with one another. Mixing between synchro and now moving to hitbox animation is not easy. It changes a large number of systems that the developers had grown accustomed to, but it's reminiscent of many changes that Ubisoft has taken, especially after these three titles are in her hands and we can see them. Earlier when discussing the interactions with the game world, we get that moment of the gladiator where Russell Crowe walks through the grass in the same way that I explained the earlier moments when Eivor looks to the highest point as a focus. Here it's that interaction with character and world in a non-impactful way that actually just adds flavor. No battle, no dying, simply a character feeling the game world. Easily taken for granted, but in my opinion, not to be taken lightly as an example of interactions. The Vikings used, or for what purpose they used, their unique constructions in the boats is sort of still a jury out kind of situation. Exactly how many men were on particular sets of oars or paddles. The history has a number of large trading ships as well that they've shown that were owned and created by the Vikings. But what we do see here are ships that are used in burial and the ability to dig them up to learn more from them. However, many of these ships are buried and they are funeral ships with a large number of ceremonial constructions on them that most likely did not actually end up on actual vessels. Viking ships were low to the water. They could be beached almost anywhere, giving both cargo ships and warships a very large tactical advantage that others didn't have. They had long distance river transits that were facilitated by their portability as well, which made it very simple to transport the boat over land from one river to another. And the keels laid down first and created with a single tree. And those branches are tested from the same tree to see if they had flexibility and if they did, they were used for ribbing as it was suitably flexible and they needed that. One of their raider ships could easily be from 10 to 15 trees total to create. A lot of people don't know that those are their shields and the idea of putting a shield on the outside of a vessel makes you go, what? But they had a rail system where the shields were actually put there, yes, to actually protect them. That is one of the really intelligent ways these guys worked that shocked me when I read it. I had always assumed it was just sort of shields they put on. It was items that they put on, and it, certainly they wouldn't put theirs on the outside, but they did. They had a railing system that was actually very good for that, and they would put those on the outside and grab them. Also, something that many people may not pick up on, but as you get different raiders and different characters from other players that if you're friends with in the game, they will have their own design shield and put that on the outside. And I just thought that was really cool, once again, pointing to the individual and the personalized feeling that these Vikings had when it came to how they did battle and what they cared about. They cared about the vessel enough and they cared about different things enough that they put the shields on the outside and of course their own lives. Let's talk about berserkers. If I didn't, people would just be absolutely up in arms. I want to discuss these guys a bit. Men who went crazy during battle, they ignored wounds and tearing into enemies like spinning tops just outfitted with sharp blades for arms. You always hear people talking about them, but there was actually a smaller group that's been discovered that mimicked a lot of wolves and wolf kind of actions. And there was a very small group, but you hear about them in some older history books. Here, especially in the last couple of years, investigations have identified two possible herbs that could have caused many of the berserkers unique fighting traits, such as not bleeding from wounds, danger to their own allies, biting, gnawing on their own clothing, and ignoring all pain. There's two. There's Fly Argaric and Henbane. Now, Fly Argaric, in fact, fits some of this, and its name is either the form of the name for attracting flies, which it does, as well as the term fly being a connection to the belief that a person drinking liquid would have flies in their head causing madness. Now, when you look at the myths of the berserkers as symptoms, some kind of natural herbal concoction seems to fit a lot of the different ideals that they had. For example, Fly Garrick dramatically lowers blood pressure, so much so that the idea of seeing one of these guys run around and get stabbed and not bleeding so much sort of begins to make sense. 
Henbane, which is in the nightshade family, was used in a lot of drinks and was proven to be used by the oracles of Apollo. Its unique symptoms actually seem to fit even more. It causes a dramatic drop in the ability to see, impacting the eyes and the vision of whoever's taken it, and the ability to discern faces, aggressive visions, and massive auditory hallucinations, all kinds of stuff. And that vision in particular really fits with the idea of these berserkers attacking their own people. And high pouch of Henbane was dated to around 980 and it was discovered to be filled with a large number of henbane seeds, which was used in the basic brew to create that drink. We will not see that I'm right until it's too late. What about Sigurd? What would he say? If Sigurd were here, he would be sitting beside you, wiping the blood from his axe and smiling into the breeze. Here's where I'm going to explain the bows and the uniqueness of the Viking. They used bows more often on boats than they did on land outside of hunting. They were actually known to strap these vessels together so they were impacted by the same waves and the same movement as another, uh, the other vessel that's tied to them, and they would use bows to shoot each other from ship to ship. And I thought that that was incredibly interesting as an idea. It's something that the Vikings are known through history to have done things slightly different, like their use of horses to ride to a battle and then get off the horses. This was something that it, even other groups that met them were like, this is the weirdest way to fight. They would basically just ride up and they would get off the horse and they would fight. They had many times actually fought cavalry and ended up doing well a couple times and terrible a couple times, but they didn't use it as much for themselves. There's a couple different stories in history that indicate that they did actually use cavalry later on um, and people on, on horseback. But for the most part, they knew how to fight from horseback. It's just it wasn't their bailiwick. It wasn't their strength. And the idea of doing it otherwise made more sense to them. So as we go to this new location, I love this spot. You know, it's really interesting that we're now at the graphical impasse almost of where we can go. What what more can you do? And you see a lot of the clutter here. This is something that I do have a slight issue with is the amount of clutter. I think a lot of value is lost there. And what I mean by that is there's just a lot of items there that other people would probably need to use. There's a lot of profit just laying around. Sheet. What happened? Nothing to crow about except to say the men who delayed us are dead. And how are you? Well enough, though I have spent many tiresome days calming the rages of our king. Viking men and women would make necklaces basically to indicate how much money they had. And necklaces, beads, anything that was carryable that had that that you could carry that had a good amount of value, they were they were just big on and they would wear a lot of times. And so the idea of seeing these sort of colored beads that she wears. You don't see that a lot of times in a lot of other games or even just in shows, but it is actually something that's pretty much backed up by all of the stuff they've been able to track. Also, the idea that Ubisoft did the smart thing, all those pelts that you see on the characters, they're all matched to a various different animal that you would actually see in the game itself. And I think that that's very cool. You don't see something that looks like these guys didn't utilize uh, the land around them. And here, of course, Avar finally coming home and talking and sort of seeing her attitude towards what's going on is it's, it's definitely a precursor. It's definitely foreshadowing for the future, which I personally was quite shocked at some of the stuff you can do later in the game. And I'm not going to, you know, ruin it for anybody, but there's a couple things you can do in this game. I was quite surprised at how characters came together or, you know, sort of who took whom as a friend or a confidant. Feeling I've not had since the day he was killed. Since the day I got this. Memories of past agonies. Of sadness and pain. I should speak with Valka. She could help me make sense of my feelings. Take your time getting settled. I will see you at the Longhouse. I think you have lost your edge, Eivor. Just like that axe. Maybe Gunnar can help you with both. I will let you know. These cutscenes are procedurally generated. But what they are is they're generated out of a system that has, like, thousands of gestures in it. And so they'll say, okay, we want this character to be here. We want the character to be aggressive, to be poised, to be courageous, to be upset, to be disgusted. And they can identify those emotions and who's going to be in the animation and they can run and it will actually mix and merge dozens of examples. And then the developers can look at the examples and choose the one that they want to use. And it actually has dynamic cameras involved, all this kind of crazy stuff. I thought that was a really intriguing way of doing it so that they could sort of identify how they wanted them to come together. It also at times doesn't work out, I think, especially when you look at those gestures and you change the subtitling. For example, if you are from a different you know, culture than I'm from, you might play with the dubs on or subs and be listening and see a character do something that 
because of what they said uh, for you, that might be a time where a character might be disgusted. But for me, it's a time where a character maybe would be excited or happy. And you can get that dichotomy, that slight difference, uh, that weird sort of offset feel. We certainly see that in this game where times you'll be talking to the characters and you'll be like, ah, this doesn't really fit exactly what they're saying. Uh, this is something that we see in other games that don't use this system, though, so certainly not holding it against them. The developers for the games have actually been pretty open about their difficulties when it comes to AI. So originally they had the AI sort of done in packets, in, in groups, and it was a reactive AI. And they decided prior to finishing Odyssey and certainly Phoenix Rising, then allow for an NPC to wait exactly what they want to do and if they're possibly able to do that particular action. What this allows is for a deliberation to occur, and that deliberation can actually occur at different moments, allowing for the CPU to get some sparing. They basically put a weight or put an action points cost on particular things, whether it be running towards an enemy, whether it be grabbing an item from the game world, <laughs> or, you know, just lighting yourself on fire. This actually worked out with Phoenix Rising, allowing them to take uh, creatures from the game world that could pick up a tree and throw it at the character, something that the original system would have required hands-on complete adjustments of the AI system to get that to work. And so they've made these huge adjustments to the AI system. Yes, it's not perfect, but I think you can certainly see how those actions are buffed up and we have more abilities, uh, changing the way that the characters actually interact and also them being able to move the deliberation to slightly different periods of time versus the reactive AI. With the new deliberation styled AI that they wanted to accomplish was randomization of some of the moves during combat. For example, an AI choosing the same stab strike many times, the developers actually wanted to get away from that to make sure that the system could dynamically weigh an alternative move as costing just a little bit less so that the AI might have a chance of buying it for its next deliberative move. This offers a little bit of flexibility to the player, and it actually fixes two issues. The first is that players, when seeing a character do that same move over and over and over again, they'll think the AI is either dumb or repetitive or quite often actually broken. The second is that it changes up combat just enough to keep the player more invested than usual. And this popped up a couple times because the old system actually had some really big problems. For example, just one that they consistently ran into. As you have multiple Assassin's Creed games and multiple Assassin's Creed games using the same engine, what was happening is sometimes you might have legacy movements that aren't really even allowed in the current game. For example, Phoenix Rising has movements Assassin's Creed didn't and vice versa. The idea of rebuilding this and starting from scratch in many ways really helped the team. And they stressed that they were actually using empirical game data from testers to show them what the AI was actually choosing, how they were weighting their choices, and then how they were ending up altering those choices as the game continued. And yes, it's for sure not perfect, but I like the idea. Vikings had a very interesting cast structure, even if you don't see it really reflected here too much. There were three levels. How those levels worked was a bit odd. For example, everyone, including slaves, could actually carry a knife. They were weapons, but a knife was considered so useful that anyone and everyone could carry it. Also, while treatment of slaves is, I'm sure, stratified into blocks of what you do when somebody sees you versus what you do when no one's around, for all intents and purposes, the cash and worth of a slave meant outfitting them with a knife just made good sense. But that does bring up another thing that I want to talk about in the avatar system and the adjustments the team have made to the AI systems, especially in the ways of giving characters many jobs or needs or desires and then outfitting those actions with weights. That's a great idea. It's a really good plan and it's a big step forward. But I do feel like Valhalla in particular keeps you from seeing those adjustments until later in the game, when they might have been more noticeable in the smaller locations. For example, your village, where you still see movement, but it's not exactly what you expect. One of the ways these guys got so rich is, uh, I was talking about this earlier, is just their ability to use every single person, and every single person knew what they needed to actually do. He's talking right there to that character and saying, hey, I'm probably going to take your daughter out raiding here soon. And she's okay with it. And you're like, how old is this kid? You know, they, to them, everybody had a knife. Everybody was able to do particular things. There was expectations put on every single person. And there was actually a bit of shunning that would really occur if a person wasn't able to do it, what they considered to be sort of the tantamount important items, important activities that they could do. Once a game comes out, we all know that every other game is going to be rated against it, especially if it does something particularly well. Red Dead 2 did handle horses very, very well. Valhalla, not so much. However, as you continue to get skills like riding in the water, it really does help you explore the world and open it up a bit.
Sorry, it took me a while to find this guy. Let's discuss flighting and oral traditions, how Ubisoft presents them. Snorri, one of the greatest of the scouts who wrote a massive amount about how traditional storytelling should be done, a majority of his writing has to do with the oral traditions themselves, breaking down alliteration as well as understanding stressed syllables and understanding how to merge stories and current locations and kings and leaders into whatever they were telling. While flighting's just a bit closer to rap battlers, it's still got its connections. The skalds were trained to have memories of the poems and the stories of their ancestors and played a massive part in Viking life. And they used these patterns to train themselves on how to interject parts and experiences that were occurring at any one time. Sometimes they would use it to harm people. Sometimes standing or reputations would actually be impacted. But mostly it was about praising those that they were near or the Jarl that they were staying with. All Viking poetry was oral. Nothing's written down. It was the ability of the skalds to understand how many consonants and syllables and how they wanted to put everything together that allowed for them to do all this. At the same time, the ability for them to slightly adjust it and tell the stories and elevate the people that they're around probably helped them actually find places to stay and sleep at night. Here, Ubisoft has gone towards the flighting style, which was also a real thing, but you do see how important the developers thought this kind of stuff was, tying charisma points into it, which is a gameplay device that lets you take your wins from previous flighting to impact the narratives of the story, which I think worked out quite well. Flighting about wit, you matched my meaning. When you think of too many perfect retorts, use the one that best matches the meaning. Last one. So go then and conquer the world with your wit. Go be clever, be quick, show your spirit and grit. I look eagerly forward to seeing how you fare. The more you play this game, the more charisma you can get at different places. And there are actually cutscenes where if you have enough charisma, you can talk to a character and have this charisma, this oral tradition charisma, where they're trying to indicate people around the world are talking about you. They're talking about Avar. That's what the charisma really is. Think about it as sort of points of renown versus charisma, but it's sort of points of renown. And you can actually go into an event and say something. And, you know, if let's say you're interrogating somebody, that person might back away from you and be scared of you. And certainly Ubisoft loves their mini games. You've also got the dice mini game here and a couple others. This is something that pops up in all the Ubisoft games to sort of separate you from the main story whenever you want to just explore. You also have the fishing game and you have a crafting system and the hunting game that are all sort of combined into this. This is the life of a Viking who has gone to another land or in this case will go to another land and try to get his people to safety and make a village that really works for them. And that means that it's not always about fighting. It can be about getting those best deals that you can get because one of the things that is always discussed around Vikings is the raids. And they weren't just raiders. They were also traders. But it is quite easy to mistake it as just a raiding kind of device. And Ubisoft did a good job. So when we talk about world building, one of the important things to me I've always talked about is past, future, future, past, environmental storytelling that indicates time and location. And we certainly get that in this game. It's one thing to be said, and I brought it up earlier, is that there's a lot of wealth sitting around. You got like shields on the ground, just laying out on the ground. That's pretty much nothing you ever heard of, or it really isn't backed up by any historical data whatsoever. All of those items, including shields, all of that stuff was made by people who were not only highly talented, but they were also, like I said, personalized. But at the same time, they were made of bits that were not necessarily cheap. It's not that they were expensive. It's just that if you start laying 40 or 50 shields down, even if they don't cost a lot, well, now you're starting to get to an expensive moment. Moving on from there, I want to discuss social stealth. During development in each game, Ubisoft has this identity and they have to identify what kind of social stealth the game is going to have that matches with it. Here, throwing your hood up makes you harder to discern from the people around you, which does make sense. But the AI itself may not always react the way I think a lot of gamers want. Understanding that Ubisoft is using a distance check for those updates, as I said before, for every dynamic item around them and how they update the creature and the enemy's AI at different ranges, we get something that feels a little looser than I think they probably wanted us to have. Ubisoft moves characters through various states depending on distance, which is virtual, which is invisible to the player, basic, which is visible, as I said before, but far enough away that checks are done, and of course your real characters. The differing in details between them and their status updates might be the problem here. This could explain also why sometimes it feels like you're safe and then a random AI calls you out because the switch from a virtual check to a bulk check into a real character in the world check and the gaps in speed as each one goes from those states 
could be slightly different, almost like frame times. And you can see how updates might have different times between them, between a character going through, not being aware of you, trying to be aware of you as someone mysterious that could actually happen at different times and then surprising you out of the blue by considering you an enemy. Ubisoft system also gives only one order to a group, three horses. The main horse will be the leader and the other two will continue to follow. If they die, then one other will become the leader as well. That's the farthest away states you'll see. For example, a horse and a rider who get a flea attached to them as an action for some kind of animal attack. It's actually only placed on the horse and that gets that tag to flee and the rider is set to follow the horse. Sometimes I see that character in a game and I just love this guy's look. I love the tattoos, something they were known to be tattooed from top to bottom. The look of him, even though he's wearing a ton of leather, which probably wouldn't have been real, just his identification, his look is so gnarled and awesome. And I love his attitude. So I'm going to do a little ride before we leave from here and do the main cutscene and jump into the next world. Horses are quite interesting in this game because they put a tax on the actual Anvil engine I wanted to talk about. So the Anvil engine is always looking out for different characters. It's doing different updates, different CPU cycles. Well, horses, of course, travel faster than a person who is running or walking. And so what has to happen is the game has always got to be prepared to be able to update at a speed of the creature that you're on. Well, guess what? If the creature that you're on changes, whether it's your feet or whether it's a horse or whether it's something else, what can actually happen is you're preparing your, your, your CPU, GPU debt. You're sort of assuming that, hey, we got to make sure we can draw this in as fast as possible. And do you prepare for that at all times? Meaning that if you're walking, everything looks better if you get my drift. So there's this issue where sometimes you have this invisible wall that you have to identify and figure out how exactly you're going to handle it. Well, the what's what's nice about this particular engine that they've done is they've really made it pretty flexible that it just sort of does the draw ins and the, the way the characters are done, the way their updating is done. It does it in a way that's pretty much unnoticeable when you get on a horse or you get off a horse, how you walk around and how you move. But that is actually something that you have to watch out for. It's something that we see in other game engines where if it's a racing engine, it's going to have to deliver you know, to the fastest car. It's going to have to say, OK, what can we deliver when it comes to polygons? How many? you know, draw uh, draw calls do we have for this particular thing that we can do in this particular time limit for the frame rate and have everything look good. If you prepare all that for a Volkswagen, you're gonna have a big issue when you jump in your Testarossa. And this is something that all these games have a problem with. I love the animation here. And I just really gotta say, this sounds so weird, but as somebody who comes from the Pacific Northwest with a lot of snow in the center part where it's turned to slush is really well done. I think that they've done a couple passes on this now since it originally came out because I actually feel like the lighting, not just this and I'm riding towards a very pretty spot, but I, I've noticed that as I was playing it for this video, it just looks a little bit better to me, something I didn't expect when I started talking, but it looks like they might have done a pass or two because this place just looks a little bit better. Of course, this fort's one of my favorite forts. I don't know why. I just think it's because of the way it's set up. It's a little momentary fort set up about how you would expect. It's just in a cool place with a cool little overwatch. Speaking of forts, it's always been difficult to understand what the Vikings wanted to do at particular forts, exactly what their plans were, because they were very well known for being highly mobile, not only in individual battles. For example, if they retreated, the other army almost always knew that that just really meant that they were backing up and they were going to a different place, either in your lands or somebody else's lands, and they would most likely show back up. And while they certainly did build long lasting locations, for the most part, the locations that they actually took when they went into an area were places that had already been built up by others. And you would see, especially historians, they go and they look at these places, you see a mixture of these different items from Vikings and then perhaps the pre group of people that had lived there. So at this point, I'm going to cut this one because we're at an hour and this is about a five or six hour video and do each one by the hour. I'd like to know what you guys think of these videos. If you like them, check out the other walking the walks I've done. And I would love for you to give some feedback, spread the word of these videos. If you like the video, hit thumbs up, subscribe, hit the notification all button, that kind of stuff. And uh, you'll see the next one in a couple days, as well as some new walking the walks coming up and a new review. Peace out and enjoy the rest of your week.